Hey everyone, it's me, Aaron, and welcome to another episode of Game Room, but this is something kind of different that we've never done here on Game Room before, but something I've been wanting to do forever. If you watch all the other shows on this channel, then you know that we have the Post Geek Out Reaction, which is a show where we basically just have a spoiler talk about movies and TV shows that we just saw, but I've been wanting to do that forever with video games, because I honestly believe that video games have some of the most interesting stories that are being told in any medium these days. But I just have never had the opportunity to get around to it. I've always gotten distracted by one thing or another. Heck, I have tried to record a Persona 5 spoiler talk about 10 different times now. And it just keeps getting interrupted or the audio keeps getting lost. But darn it, if there is one game out right now that I need to do a spoiler talk on, it is God of War. I need to do this so bad, you guys can't see it, but I am literally banging my hand on my armrest because I'm trying to emphasize how important it is to talk about spoilers in this game. Uh, as you can probably tell right now, this is not scripted, it is just my open thoughts about the thing that I just finished playing right after I finished playing it. So this is gonna be a little bit of rambling going on, and as you can see, I just have some footage of me playing God of War going up there. Uh, I will have footage of the various things I am talking about, but it's not going to be the cleanest edited together video I've ever done because yeah this is basically just kind of like a hangout session here this is basically just me coming in here because I really just want to talk about how amazing this game was and how great the story was now to start for anybody out there who wants to know okay so how far did you get in the game I mean you beat it but what exactly did you do in the game I platinum this thing in like two weeks which is the quickest I have ever platinumed a game. I like always going for as many trophies in a game as I can. It's a bit of an addiction, I will admit that. But man, I have never gone through one that quickly. That is how much in love I was with this game. Uh, so yeah, I basically did about everything you could do. I even got the Infinity Gauntlet in the game. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, there is an item that you can get that if you equip it with three out of uh, five specific gems that you can get in this game, uh, each of which, oh, I'm sorry, six specific gems. Wow, what kind of a comic book fan am I? With one of six different gems that you can get in this game, it will basically create the Infinity Gauntlet for you, and it will give you an attack where if you punch forward, it will shoot out three different energy beams, and then they will even start tracking the enemy you're firing at. Uh, it's one of the coolest attacks in the entire game. But yeah, so I even did that. Uh, in fact, I kind of wish that they had given you a trophy for that, but then again, that's just because I am a trophy addict, and I need to see a little thing pop up on the screen to remind me that I am doing good. So yes, yeah, so let's go ahead and get into it, but let me just go ahead and remind everyone, we did an actual spoiler-free review of this thing, and it is popping up in a card right now, so if you did not watch that and you have not beat this game yet, then go ahead and click on that card if you want my opinions on this, because I was able to express a lot of my feelings toward this game in that review without having to get into spoilers. Like I said, the development of Kratos that we get in here is amazing. I love that this took this guy who he was just a rage locomotive, just I am going from point A to point B to murder everything in my path. I love that they took that guy and they asked the real questions with him, which is, okay, you got revenge, now what? Now what do you do when the thing that has defined you throughout all these games, it's over with. You did it. You killed Ares, then you killed your dad Zeus, and you killed all the other gods too. What do you have now? What exactly becomes of you? And this took such a great turn in which it showed that he did sell down, he did marry another woman, he did have a child, but this wife has passed away, much like his first wife, except his first wife and child passed away because Ares tricked him into murdering them. This wife has passed away. They don't even really say, I don't think, unless it was like a real quick thing that they mentioned towards the end of this, because I will admit there are bits of the end of this that I did not catch, simply because I was just freaking out the entire time by the parts I was catching. Um, so they might have mentioned it real quick at some point, but yeah, I just assume it's like a virus or just something that... Uh, Kratos just can't really place any blame on. Like, she died of something that Kratos can't go out there and murder back. He can't get revenge all over again. No, we have to see what happens when the guy who knew nothing but rage, now it's like, well, yeah, I'm mad. 
and I'm going to mourn in my own way. That was a great line that they had in here at that one moment in which Atreus thought that, oh yeah, you don't even care about me, you don't even care about mom, and he just flat out tells him, listen, we all mourn in different ways. This is how I mourn. I thought that was great for him. But yeah, it was great to see, like, yeah, what exactly do you do when this is the new situation that you're facing? When you can't go out there and just punch your problems away, when you can't just basically murder your way to revenge. Yeah, this is a much quieter story, and I thought that was so amazing that they decided to go in that direction with this. Uh, also, seeing Kratos walk around with Atreus, but also Mimir, when you eventually get him to join your team, uh, and he was there. I thought he was going to be there for like five minutes of the game, and then you would lose him again. No, he's there for the entire game. I absolutely love that this game said, hey, what if Kratos just had someone to talk to? Uh, maybe not even talk to, but someone he's forced to interact with. Uh, and it does paint so many more sides to his character. I really enjoyed every single little bit of the exchanges that they had. And what I really enjoyed is that in the beginning with Mimir, with uh, the two dwarves that you run into, with the Witch of the Woods, I love that Kratos was just Kratos. He was just, I don't care. I just want to go get this thing over with. I don't like talking to any of you. It's taking everything I have to not murder every single one of you because that's all I know. But by the end of this, it's not like they had Kratos make a full turn. It's not like they had him just go, oh, you know what? Everybody, group hug. Everybody come in here. But he was like, oh, hey guys. Like, and for Kratos, that is huge progress. But it's believable progress that you can buy for the amount of story that you got in here, which that's something else that we need to talk about in here, is that I know some people out there are really mad at this game because, I almost said movie, sorry, are really mad at this game because it's not really a complete story to them. Like, they went into this like, oh yeah, it talked about Odin, it talked about Thor the entire time. You even kill Thor's sons. But man, the whole thing with Thor, that's just a teaser for the next game. I was absolutely fine with that because that wasn't the point of this game. Yes, they talk about Odin. They talk about Thor. But they are never really part of the plot aside from if you want to go into Thor's sons being there. But Thor's sons are always just there to be Baldur's henchmen, really. Um... What the thing that they talk about throughout this entire game is Kratos has to go and drop off the ashes of his wife. He has to go and scatter them from the destination that she wanted her ashes scattered from. That's what this game is. That's the end goal. And this game, again, the previous games set up Kratos is out for revenge. This game set out Kratos is out to mourn. That's what this story is about. And yeah, the story of a man mourning isn't really the same as the story of a man going for revenge. So yes, to me, eventually like halfway through this game, not even that, in all honesty, by the time that you got to the giant, uh, I almost said the giant, giant mountain, but yeah, the mountain that looks like a giant's face, by the time that you got to that, that's when it kind of hit me. This story is really taking a sweet time. Oh, we're not going to do any of that stuff that you do in the other God of War games. Like, I realize quick in this, that is not what this game is going to be. So, I accepted it early on. I mean, if you were holding on to it until the end, and then when Thor pops up, it's like, oh, here we go, finally, and then it just goes to credits. It's like, yeah, I can understand you being mad about that, but, hey, that comes after you had already gotten the first inning. That's the Marvel post credit stinger of this game. You had already gotten one credits sequ uh, you had already gotten one credits sequence before that, so by then, shouldn't you have kind of like come to terms with the fact that, yeah, this wasn't what the game was going to be. This was not a God of War game about Kratos going out there just to murder more gods. This was a God of War game about Kratos having to basically progress as a human being and get more dimensions to himself. And I understand that video games aren't just story. Video games are gameplay. So if somebody came in here and said, these are the things I enjoyed from the previous God of War games and they're not in this God of War game and it's called God of War, shouldn't I be mad about that? I can understand that. I'm not coming in here and like pointing fingers at someone's like, oh, you didn't get it. No, not at all. I understand. Hey man, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and then you find out it's not a duck at the end, I can understand you being a little bit miffed about it, but I really do dig that they focus more on the story of this and focus more on the progression of Kratos as a character, and that's what this game was all about. But also, I'm a big Norse mythology fan. 
And there came a moment early on in this game. Like, when the stranger pops up at your house, I had no idea who he was. I would never have guessed that was Balder, which I probably should have when he mentioned I can't feel anything. I should have realized that, but I kept going, yeah, he's acting like Jack Sparrow. Doesn't he feel more like Loki if I had to guess anyone? But then I kept going through like the random smaller Norse gods. And I was like, well, I don't know. They're not really well known enough for them to need to even stick by them. They could change them into whatever they want to change them into. But when I found out it was Balder, I was like, oh, that's interesting because Balder was invincible. So this is a good, like, the dark, gritty, real world version of Balder, if I have to put it into terms like that. It was basically the version of Balder in which, yeah, what would happen if you actually couldn't feel anything? If you actually were invincible, that would kind of mess with you. And I like that you kind of get sympathetic to Balder because when you find out for hundreds of years this guy has been living in total numbness when his mother gave him this curse because she thought, no, no, my precious baby, I must protect my precious baby no matter what. I love that twist because it goes, okay, Balder has been a complete asshole throughout this entire game, but when you get to see that whole sequence, it does make you realize, oh, shoot, uh, I kind of thought that Freya was really good and I was cheering Freya on, but now that I know that she did these things, it's making me think back to that moment when she saw the mistletoe arrows and she flipped out and she kind of got a little bit dark there and went, oh shoot, that was her real self coming out. Freya's kind of crazy and Balder is kind of a sympathetic character. It was amazing they were able to flip that like two thirds of the way through this game in a way that I didn't question, a way that I absolutely was able to buy into. Um... But yeah, as I said, when I saw it was Balder, the moment that you got the mistletoe arrows, I went, Oh, I know what this game is going to be. Because in Norse mythology, there is the story of Ragnarok, which many people out there know, it's the twilight of the gods. It's the moment in which all the gods died. And it began when Loki was able to kill Balder using the one thing that could hurt him, a mistletoe arrow. So when they gave Atreus the... Wow, I'm really trying to, like, lead up to that big reveal about who Atreus is. So hold on, everyone. I'll get to that. Uh, but when it gets to that moment where Atreus gets the mistletoe arrows, I just went, I know exactly what this game is going to be. This is going to be Kratos causes Ragnarok. But then there came a point in there. In which I was looking at this like, yeah, if you were going to do that, I know this game is way longer than a normal God of War game. But shouldn't we have like started this? I mean, if this is going to be all about Ragnarok and Balder dying is the first part of Ragnarok, shouldn't we be moving this along? And I can't really remember the exact moment when I realized it, but there did come a moment in which it really hit me. Oh, yeah, this is not going to be Ragnarok. This is going to be the start of Ragnarok. This is going to be Ragnarok Begins. That's the point of this game. This whole game is going to end with you killing Balder. And then the next game, that's going to be Ragnarok. So, again, for all the people out there who are like, well, you didn't get to do the stuff in this game that you normally do in a God of War game, I'm okay with it, partly because I realized early on that's not what this game is going to be. This game was, hey, character development for Kratos. Let's make him a more developed character. Let's show growth with him. Let's show character progression with him. And when you get to the end of this game, in which he says he's finally free, holy cow, I love that moment in there. But again, I'm saving up for that. Uh, but yeah, so I think they absolutely nailed what this game was supposed to be. And that's kind of what I want this game to be. I want this game to actually take the character of Kratos and actually make him a more developed character. He's honestly one of my favorite characters now of this year in any game, and it's going to be hard for any other character to top him this year. So yeah, in a way, I kind of feel like for all those people out there who wanted the God of War games, the games that they had always known, just set in Norse mythology, I feel like in order to make Kratos a better character, you needed one game between this and Ragnarok. You needed the game that was really just about him developing as a character, and then the next game can be Ragnarok, which is him just murdering all the Norse gods. So, I kind of feel like for all those people who are upset about this not being a typical God of War game, don't worry, man. It's coming. For now, just enjoy the really moving indie film version of God of War, which is kind of what this is. Um, but okay, let's go ahead and get into Atreus. Uh, I was digging Atreus as a character, uh, because A, he was not the annoying kid sidekick. 
He was not the kid who was just coming in there trying to be like a smart mouth. Uh, there's a lot of games that give like the gruff grizzled guy the young smart mouth sidekick and I just I don't really enjoy that. Uh, this is going to be one of the most controversial video game opinions I've ever had but a lot of people kept comparing this to uh, The Last of Us and I can see that but here's the thing. I didn't really like Ellie in The Last of Us because I cannot stand the foul mouth kid uh, trope. Not because it's a trope. People being mad at someone for being a trope just means, hey, I'm mad that I've seen this thing before. No, no, no. You can take things I've seen before and do them in unique new ways I enjoy. But I just have always hated the, oh, the gruff old guy has to have a foul mouth kid psychic. I've always hated that. It's just something I've never enjoyed. And even though I say I didn't really like Ellie, she is a great character. I will still step back and look at her objectively and just say, yes, she is an amazing character. They did a great job with her in that game. It's just the type of character she is is just one I don't enjoy. But Atreus? I love that Atreus is going through very difficult times himself. I mean, his mother just died and you get to really delve into that. But also, he's got a dad who is basically just a furnace. His dad is basically the equivalent of something full of coal and fire, and he has to have that as his emotional support. So Atreus is really just trying to keep lifting himself up and just try to not piss off his dad. I love seeing Atreus' progression throughout this, but there comes that moment in which Kratos reveals to him that he's a god, which I really dig this idea that Atreus kept getting sick because Kratos didn't want to tell him he was a god, and because being a god is kind of a mental thing, Atreus' body was rejecting what it really was, like his mind couldn't comprehend what, he's, what he was, so he was rejecting himself, and that's why he was sick. I think that's actually kind of a cool thing, because uh, it's kind of a metaphor for Kratos. Kratos never really wanted to admit what he was, uh, and that led up to that amazing moment in which he had to go and get the Blades of Chaos again. That entire sequence was chilling. That entire segment of just him on the boat, just going back to the house, I didn't even know what he was going to do, but when the camera spun around and you just saw him talking to Athena, I just went, oh, oh, I think I know what's happening and it's not going to be good for Kratos. And the moment he picks up the blades and he says, yes, he is a monster, but he's not, but I'm not your monster anymore. It was great because it was kind of him like saying, yes. I can't escape my past. I know what I've done. I know what I am. I have to accept it. But I am now going to choose to be this monster for my son, not for you. And I thought, okay, even when he has to accept the monster that he is, he's now taking control of his life. It's actually, again, it's great stuff to do with the character of Kratos. Um... But I really dig that this is a thing that Kratos has been running from. He hates that he's a god. He hates all the gods. He thinks all the gods are evil and terrible. And I love that one of the story elements in this is them learning the story of the god who actually was good. And there actually were some good gods. Uh, and I love that there comes that moment in here in which he fi has to finally tell his son this. And he, you can see it on his face, he just assumes his son is going to reject him. His son is going to hate him for this. His son is going to feel betrayed and just want to lash out at his father the same way that Kratos lashed out at his father of Zeus. But Atreus' very first words are, Can I turn into an animal? Like, just the most innocent, like, uplifting, upbeat thing. And I was like, oh my god, this... Just the look on, like, Kratos' face. I can't even really put it into words, but the look on Kratos' face in which he's like, an, an animal? Like, he can't even comprehend this. He can't even comprehend the idea that, wait, my son doesn't hate me? And he's okay with this? I loved seeing that moment in there. Uh, in fact, while we were rowing in the boat, they continued that dialogue. He was like, are you sure I can't turn into an animal? You are welcome to surprise me, boys. Like, even Kratos is kind of playing along with it. He's kind of like, okay with, all right, I guess we'll explore where this goes. But that led into Atreus's character turn, in which he really just goes to the dark side quick. And I had that moment in which I thought, oh, God, don't let this become Kratos has to kill his own son. 
because Kratos, because Atreus has gone mad with power. And when this first started to happen, I thought, wow, this character turn is bad. I do not like this character turn for Atreus. It just doesn't make sense for the character I've been seeing this entire time. But then I was watching some uh, Let's Players play through the game, and there came a moment in the game early on, early on, where Atreus says, it's fun to be strong, isn't it? Or it was something like that, and I went, oh, I guess they did plant some seeds for him being the kind of character who would go mad with power. But, it comes to that moment in which he has to, like, face his sins uh, down in the underworld. He has to see, like, the terrible things that he's done. And after he sees that, and he's like, no, that, that wasn't me. I was like, what do you mean it wasn't you? You literally did that. You saw yourself doing it. And I thought, oh shoot, it's kind of like the human side, the human and, I'll go ahead and say it now, the human and the giant side of Atreus is fighting the darkness of the god side inside of him. And that, of course, all leads up to the big reveal at the end, which really made me look back at the dark sides of Atreus and go, oh, I get it. In which they make it to the world of the giants. They see the big tapestry that lays out Atreus' entire life, including his future. And after they scatter the ashes, Atreus says, Yeah, but it's weird. Those murals, they didn't call me Atreus. They called me Loki. Oh my god, the chills. The chills, people, that I got. Because the entire time I was like, okay, they keep talking about Owen, they keep talking about Thor. Where's Loki in all this? It's kind of weird that they would leave out one of the major Norse figures in this. And then it's revealed... He's Loki, and there's like, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Kratos' wife's name was Faye. In Norse mythology, Loki's father's name was Laufey. And then there's a moment after that, if you go back and you talk to the dwarves, they go, oh, yeah, we knew your mother, Laufey. And I went, oh, game, you are smart. That is good game. Oh, never even will put that together. And... After you learn that he's Loki, you look back at so many of the little things in here, and it makes you go, oh my god, I get this now. Like, when Mimir, uh, when Atreus finally learns that he's a god, Mimir says, you've already shown that you have skills. Your mastery of language is unlike anything I've seen. Loki was the god of trickery. Trickery is the manipulation of language. That makes absolute sense in here. And then they have Jormungand, the world snake in there. And Jormungand in Norse mythology is the child of Loki. But then they mention that because Jormungand fought during Ragnarok, the world tree got split and Jormungand got sent back in time. So that actually makes sense why he would be here. But it would also make sense for why Jormungand would be like, oh, hey dad, allow me to help you out with this. It actually makes a ton of sense. Um, also, the very first thing that uh, Atreus says when he learns he's a god is, can I turn into an animal? Turning into an animal was one of the main things that Loki was known for in Norse mythology. And as I said, Ragnarok began because Loki was able to trick Balder into getting hit with a mistletoe arrow. Kratos had to tie one of the mistletoe arrows, the one that Freya missed, he tied it around Atreus's uh, arrow satchel, whatever that's called, I don't know anything about archery, sorry. The thing that holds his arrows together, he tied it around that strap to hold it together, and then Balder ran up and punched him in the chest, and then when Balder pulls his fist back, he reveals it's bleeding because he punched the mistletoe arrow, which broke the invulnerability spell on him. That moment you go, oh my god, Atreus kinda did trick Balder into getting hit by the mistletoe arrow. It's incredible how much they laid all the groundwork for that out there. Uh, and as I said, Loki was a very sinister, mischievous, evil god. So this idea that Atreus might have a sinister, evil, mischievous side to him, buried deep within him, and he's going to have to learn how to combat that, that's incredible. I love that. That is a great thing that they were going to have to do for this character. Because as I said, I really didn't like how quickly he turned when he learned he was a god that he started becoming evil but when you think about the fact that the reason why Atreus kept getting sick is because his body was trying to fight itself when you realize the god side of him actually is kind of an evil spirit it actually is kind of an evil version of himself and his body was rejecting the evil inside of him 
it actually is a way better explanation of all this. You can actually read into that about why he got sick, but also why he suddenly turned evil. The moment that he accepts that he's a god, that evil side of him is allowed to come out. Uh, and that's something that we can definitely see playing out in future games. However, I do know some people in here that is reading that as, okay, so this means that Atreus is definitely going to turn evil at some point in time, and Kratos will have to kill his own son. First off, I don't think that's going to happen because we even saw in that big giant uh, memorial that they paid out to Atreus, we saw his future side, and in the future, we see, yeah, Kratos is going to die, and it looks like the giant snake Jormungand is coming out of Atreus at that moment. Uh, I do know someone on Twitter who uh, said that they have a theory that Jormungan actually is Kratos from the future, that L when he's dying, Loki uses his magic to basically transform him into Jormungan. I can see that. I mean, Jormungan uh, in this game actually is white, kind of like Kratos is. So, yeah, okay, I can actually see that. I don't know if I fully believe it, but I would accept that. That actually makes sense to me. Um, but yeah, we get to see, A, that Loki will birth uh, Jormungan, but we do get to see, yeah, Kratos ain't exactly making it, and he ain't exactly going to kill his own son. So, when you look at this, the classic story of Ragnarok in Norse mythology, Thor was the good guy, Odin was the good guy, all those other gods, Balder, they were the good guys, Loki and Jormungan and Hela and the wolf Fenrir, they were all the bad guys, but in this game, A, Loki is already one of our protagonists, Jormungan is helping us out, we see that Balder is a complete sack of shit, we see that he is a complete asshole that we have to go and stop and, uh, he's basically just trying to murder his own mother and trying to murder us and murder everyone else. Yeah, man, I don't think he's going to turn evil. I think this is going to take the classic story of Ragnarok, of the evil gods end up killing all the good gods, and basically flip it and go, hey, man, Loki's actually the good guy. They're actually the good ones. The regular Norse gods, they were the bad guys. I mean, heck, you hear numerous stories in here from the ghost who you get side quests from about how evil Thor is. You hear stories from Amir about what a madman Odin is. So, yeah, man, I totally see it going that direction. Uh, and this is something that we talked about on Twitch when we were streaming the finale of this. We just had a big old chat there about this and about where the story could go. We do know that the original creators of God of War wanted to see Kratos eventually go up against uh, the Egyptian gods. And there's even like hints of the Egyptian gods. There's hints of the Shinto gods in here. So yeah, they definitely are hinting at basically this story continuing. But if Kratos dies, like I said, Kratos, he got his arc in here. And typically, when a character who was retired comes back for one last mission, and he's older and more grizzled and has the big ol' I've seen some shit beard, and he gets a big character arc in which he accepts, you know what, I finally moved past my past all the dark stuff behind me. I finally moved on, I finally progressed as a person, I become a better person like Kratos does in here. Typically, they die shortly after that. So yeah, I think the next game, Ragnarok, it's going to be Kratos' last game. But if they want to continue this, I could totally see Loki slash Atreus now being the hero of the future God of War games and just seeing him like go to Egypt, him go to uh, say like Japan or some other country and seeing their gods. So yeah, I think this game actually has a big future to it and I'm shocked that it's going to be following Loki. Uh, but okay, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, thank you to everyone who watched our review. Thank you to everyone who follows us on Twitch. Man, I am always impressed by the people that we get over on Twitch. It's always a fun time over there. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitch, check us out at twitch.tv slash Professor Thorgy. I'm sure there's going to be tons of things that I forget to talk about in here, and I will come back with later. Um, but for now, those were the highlights. Those were the things I really wanted to talk about. But thanks again for tuning in, everyone. Come back next time. Bye.